see my brother. I see my brother. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. I see my brother. Think that was beautiful? I wonder how many of us this morning are tired of the division and polarization that we see in America today. Any of you tired of that? You know, today you can't watch the news or listen to it or uh, see a you know social media feed or. Uh, to have a conversation without talking about what divides us today and all of the different kinds of polarizations. I think that we saw a pretty graphic example of it uh, last Tuesday at the State of the Union address. While uh, President Trump gives a speech and Nancy Pelosi rips it up and it kind of shows, it's maybe what defines us as a nation today. We are polarized politically, socioeconomically, often ethnically, and uh, culturally today. We're divided. You probably have heard the very life-changing story of uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Uh, they go camping together, and it's a beautiful starry night. They set up their tent, they jump in, and they're sleeping in the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes gets up and he said, Dr. Watson, take a look at the stars and tell me, what do you deduce? And he said, well, I see billions and billions of stars. And if there's billions of stars, there's probably planets around some of those stars. And maybe some of those planets even have life, maybe even human life. 
And Sherlock Holmes says, Watson, you idiot, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> kind of missed it, didn't he? And gang, I think that the church of Jesus Christ, to a very significant degree, has missed it at this time and at this place and in this season of America. We have the greatest opportunity in, in the world to be the unifying agents in our world. We are the ones with the biblical mandate. We are the ones with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones endowed with gifts of the Holy Spirit to bring unity. And I think that oftentimes, even in the church, we're being used by an enemy to further divide us politically, ethnically, socioeconomically. I mean, it's true that today still 11 o'clock is the most segregated hour in America. And this should not be. We should and must in this hour take the lead in being unifying agents in our culture today. Today I have a hope for unity in the midst of a polarized world. We're continuing our series today on Activate, where we hope to activate this vision. Our hope is to take that vision off the wall, put it into our lives and into our community that desperately needs the presence of Jesus in our world today. And so our hope is to activate that vision. We've looked at it, igniting a movement of spirit-filled, multicultural people that radically impact our communities and beyond. And, and uh, last week we looked at the, the, the Holy Spirit, and the last two weeks actually, and today we're going to focus on the heart of that vision being multicultural, and then we're going to look at our, our value too of being intentionally inclusive. And gang, I don't know a time, at least in my tenure, as a pastor here, where this is a more significant and important and timely vision and value of being spirit-filled, multicultural churches that radically bless our community and beyond, that we are intentionally inclusive in an age of polarization and division. This is an important time. Amen? And so here's the big idea that I hope to communicate today. And uh, you can take a look at this with me. Would you read it? Reconciliation is central to the gospel, essential in our polarized world, and how we can grow as reconcilers. So we're going to see how this is not only central to the gospel, but it is essential in our very polarized world. And uh, I hope to equip us to grow as reconcilers. So before we get to the good news, is it okay if we look at some bad news? Well, tough, we're going to do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> Why are we so polarized? I think it's important to ask that question. I've sat with that all week. I've talked with uh, a lot of different people. and have, uh, why, why are we so polarized? Now, I think that there are lots of reasons, you know, historically and socially, and why, why at this time we are so polarized in America. But I want to I offer us three that I think maybe capture a good portion of it. There's, of course, a lot more. But why are we so polarized? I would suggest, first of all, we are shaped by consumerism. And I talked about this last week in relation to worship, right? We are live, we, and it's not our fault. We have been uh, discipled, taught, even brainwashed in our culture to be consumers. And consumerism is this, this, this idea, this philosophy, this religion today that the more I have, the better it is, and so on. And so we are consumers. And we can even enter worship as consumers. We, don't often, you know, we can often not come to glorify God and to receive from him. And remember, worship is, that, is that, uh, that, that divine kind of connection between God and human beings where we encounter the living God, right? That's worship. But it can be about consumers. We can come uh, to worship as a consumer to receive a religious product, and then we can like, get all Amazon uh, on, on it and, and say, you know, this, that was 3.5 stars or something, and you know, be critics rather than worshipers, right? So we talked about that last week. But I, I think that e consumerism can be a lens with which we see the world. 
we are consumers. We can be so, it can lead to radical, you know, who's consumerism all about? Me, the consumer. And we can think that, you know, what's good for me, and we can globalize that, must be good for everybody. And it can lead to kind of a radical self-centeredness and self-consumption and a self-righteousness. I'm right. And all those people are idiots because they don't think like me. And if they just think a little bit more like me, we'd be fine. Right? No amens there. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, if, and if we think if something doesn't benefit me, then it's wrong. And it must be wrong for everyone. And it's myopic. And we don't see our brother or sister who's not like me in that scenario. And uh, we don't see our brother from different circumstances, different backgrounds, ethnicities, socioeconomics, and we can just see it through my perspective. And because I think it, it must be true. And this happens on both sides of the fence, gang. Liberals, conservatives, uh, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic, we, we view life through our lenses and we don't see our, our brother and sister. A second, I think, important shaping factor in our culture today is fear and ignorance. I would suggest that the dominant narrative in our culture today is one of fear of the other. And I would say it like this, in politics, let's just use politics as an example. We fear if that person gets in office, then the whole world's going to... I don't want somebody tweeting, Pastor Dave said hell in church, he swore in church. That's a biblical word, all right? We think that if that person, then that is our hope in politics. Our hope is in Jesus, gang. And we get so entrenched in our political tribe, in this fear of others that are not like me. It, it, it creates this tribalism. You know what tribalism is? We, we tend to, because I fear and I don't understand and I don't know my brother or sister who's different, we can get entrenched in our tribes. And rather than building bridges of friendship and love, we can build walls of tribalism. I stay in my tribe. Republicans, Democrats, whites, blacks. We can get uh, uh, the rich, the poor, and we can get caught up in our tribe, and our tribe is right. And we can go pointing fingers. You know, it's their fault. It's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's the whites. It's the blacks. It's the cops. It's the hood. It's whatever that separates us. And we blame. And we shame. And it can be all about me. And this tribalism continues to further the divide. Right? And I want to ask us, is that the Christian way? Fear? 365 times. I think that's convenient. And one for every day of the year. 365 times. Fear not, the Bible teaches. Fear not. Perfect love casts out all fear. You know, is the gospel to hate and to uh, distrust and to and to be prejudiced and to be, you know, all of these words that define our culture, hate and division, is that the gospel? We're shaped by fear. We're shaped by ignorance. We're shaped by consumerism. And then I would suggest we're shaped by social media and the news. Is anyone as crusty as I am and remember a time when news actually gave news? <laughs> you remember that? When you'd watch a newscast and they would just simply give you news. When you'd read a news, you know, read the news, and it would be news. Today it is entertainment, and it is polarization. Today news outlets have brands, and they have loyal followers, and so. And I don't even have to mention CNN and Fox, right? We know that we see the news through a particular lens, and what that does is it further puts us into our tribes. So we watch or listen to the news that most aligns with our tribe, 
And then we cast bombs at the other one. And the, and the news gives it to us in such a way, these guys are all good, these guys are all bad. Get it? And so we are further polarized by our news. And then I'm going to say social media. And even saying that word is polarizing, I think. Uh, so now, now, please hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I am not saying all social media is bad. Get rid of your Twitter account or whatever. Maybe. But I'm not saying that, okay? There's a lot of beauty in social media. I mean, we can connect with people and, you know, there's all kinds of good stuff, right? True? Good things. But I want to suggest that in our culture today, what can happen is that social media is an impersonal and it can be an unfiltered platform where I don't have to deal with my brother or sister face to face. I don't have to look at anybody. I don't have to have conversation. I can just lob bombs at those that I don't agree with. Right? That's what so often happens in social media is it's unfiltered and it's uh, impersonal. And uh, that's one of our major forms of communication today. And again, let me ask us, is this the gospel? Does Christ call us to blast our enemies and hate those who are different than us? Is it to be self-centered and I'm right and they're a jerk? Is that the gospel? Or does the gospel call us to love our neighbors and our enemies even who are not like us? Central to the gospel is reconciliation. What does that word reconciliation mean? Let's think about that word. Reconciliation, what is it? To repair, to restore, to, to bring the two that are, are, are different together as one. It's to bring unity in a polarized world. That is, I want to suggest, at the very heart of the gospel and is central in our polarized world today. We need the gospel in our world today. So here, here is the hope of the gospel. And uh, I'm going to give us a couple of words about the hope of our gospel. We're going to do a little Bible study and a little theology. Are you ready? So let's put on your bibs. We're going to do a little eating. All right? I want to suggest today diversity is biblical and beautiful. Say it. Diversity is biblical and beautiful. Now, I could point to all kinds of texts in Scripture, but the one that's grabbed my heart most recently is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if you look at the context of 1 Corinthians 12, it is the Corinthian church, and they are polarized by spiritual gifts, crazy enough. Here's this beautiful thing that God gives us gifts, and they were polarized. These gifts are really important. These gifts aren't very important. I got this gift, what you got. And they were polarized by their gifts. And then Paul gives this powerful analogy. Take a look. Even so, let's, can we stand? Let's stand. Let's honor the word. If you're able to stand, please stand. Watch what Paul is saying about our differences. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, is that good? Where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where the sense of smell would be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all part, one part, where would the body be? Did you catch it? He's giving us this, this, this ridiculous image. Imagine there's an eyeball sitting on my podium here. And the eyeball says, I am the body. I don't need you. I'm all good in and of myself. Is that ridiculous? I mean, is that, it's like, it's like a band with one player. It's like a football team with one player. It doesn't work. It's foolish. Then, but I, I want you to notice that the context is not just about spiritual gifts. He broadens this. Take a look. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13, for we are all baptized. He broadens this. He's not just talking about spiritual gifts. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles. Now that is, so, uh, that is um, ethnic, cultural, and religious differences. Jews and Gentiles were enemies and they were very divided. They did not hang together, okay? And slave or free. Now, there wasn't so much uh, classism like today where there's upper, middle, and lower. It was pretty much the rich and the poor, the haves and the haves nots. And they were divided socioeconomically. And in other portions of Scripture, we talk about, in, in Galatians, uh, Paul says, in Christ, there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew or Gentile. He's breaking down those walls of division and saying that we are one in Christ. Amen? You may be seated. It's so word of the Lord. We're going to dig in a little deeper. Paul is saying that each part is significant and, re and important. All the gifts are significant and important. Every one of us is interdependent and dependent on the other. And I would suggest that in the church, an all white, all black, all rich, all poor, all abled, all disabled, all um, white, all black, all, whatever that is incomplete and does not fully represent who God is. And I can say that as a personal testimony. Um, now as I go to you know, different churches that may be all white or all black or, or all uh, a certain socioeconomic class, I can say, yes, the Spirit of God is there and it's, it's beautiful, but something's missing. I think something's missing. And, and it's like having part, half a body or part of a body. Together, we make up the body of Christ. Male and female, rich and poor, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, um, young and old, we make up the body of Christ. And it's beautiful. And... So diversity is important. Diversity is biblical. I mean, just look at the creation. I mean, did God make one kind of flower? Did God make one kind of animal? I mean, God loves diversity. Look around this room. God loves diversity. And I would say that diversity is not only deeply biblical, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I do a fair amount of marital counseling and premarital counseling. And one of the things that I uh, am very careful to point out, particularly in premarital counseling, is celebrate your differences. Celebrate your differences. So important to celebrate our differences. And, and, and I give this little analogy oftentimes. If you've heard it before, deal with it. Um, I, I tell this story about there was a, a, a bride who was terrified on her wedding day. She was so anxious about her wedding. And so um, it, it gets to the wedding day, and she's about to go down, and she's just freaking out. And her mother pulls her aside, and she says, Honey, she says, don't worry about all the people out there. Don't worry about all the plans that have to be made. She said, You know what? Just focus on three things. First of all, focus on the aisle. That's where you're going to be going down to meet your future spouse. And, and then focus on the altar. Just focus on the altar. That's where you're going to be making your vows and your lifelong vows, and they're beautiful. And, and then we're going, to see, we're going to sing a hymn. Just you know, focus on the lyrics of that hymn. It's a beautiful hymn that talks about love and, and our God and all the rest. Just focus on those things, and, and you're, you're going to be fine. You're going to do fine. And so the, the bride says, okay, I can do it. I can do this. I can do this. And so as she's walking down the aisle, she uh, is quoting this little mantra out loud. Aisle, altar, him. Aisle, altar, him. Aisle, altar, him. Oh, my goodness. 
And everyone's kind of snickering like you are. And I say to couples, don't do it. So often we get together because of our differences. And then we spend the rest of our married lives trying to change the other person to become more like me. If you'd be more like me, we'd be fine. I say, don't do it. So often we're, 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 I think we're intuitively drawn to people that are different because they complete us. They, they, they make us better. And if it's working right, that's how it works. Celebrate your differences. And I think the same is true in the church. We need to celebrate our differences. Now, I've said this before. Every church in America has on their sign, all welcome. But the truth is, you're welcome if you look like us, act like us, dress like us, smell like us, vote like us, worship like us, then you're welcome. And if not, we'll let you know in some very clear and not so clear ways, you're not welcome. We like the idea of being multicolored, but we don't want to be multicultural because then things have to change. And, and, and we like the idea of having different color skin, but don't bring any of that kind of music in here or don't have that kind of art on our wall or whatever it is. You know, it's like having a foreign exchange student at your home and saying, you're welcome here, but, you know, don't put any of that music in, in your, you know, earbuds or whatever. Don't put any of that food in my refrigerator. Don't put any of your art on my wall. Are you really welcome? Multiculturalism being diverse is biblical and it's beautiful and it's important. We need to be celebrators of diversity. Some, some have asked me, you know, Dave, aren't we just supposed to be colorblind? And I say, heavens, no. We are to be color enriched. You know, God has given us, you know, not, we're not just to be a nice smoothie where everything's blended into one, become like the dominant culture. But it's more like a salad. We can enjoy the different tastes and textures and colors. I mean, how beautiful would it be to go into a garden where every flower is the same color and size and everything else? What makes a garden beautiful is the diversity of different colors and textures and shapes and sizes and smells. And it's beautiful. Diversity is biblical and it's beautiful and it's important. And uh, check this out. Here's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It makes the two one. As Christ is the head, and all the different parts, Republican and Democrat, white and black, and Asian and Hispanic, and rich and poor, and old and young come together through the blood of Jesus Christ unites us into one body with one head. And it's not my head and it's not your head. It's Christ's. And we are joined together by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, now gang, this isn't meant to stay in the walls of the church. This is meant to impact our world that we live in. The gospel isn't supposed to stay in the church. The salt can't be the salt if it stays in the salt shaker. It's supposed to impact the world. So uh, we're going to dig into a little theology. Ready to do some, a little theology? Here we go. Reconciliation is essential in our polarized world. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures that kind of capture this. Uh, Christ's work. What is Christ's work? Why did Jesus come into the world? Just to save our souls for heaven, right? I hope you say no if you've been around Living Springs. All right? Jesus came not only to bring our souls into heaven, but to bring heaven to earth. That's what Jesus taught. Bringing the kingdom to earth. So, just a couple of scriptures. We know, we, we, uh, many of us know these scriptures. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The blood of Jesus Christ reconciles us to God. We are separated by our sin, but Jesus died so that we could be brought into relationship, friendship with God. You know, that's the first kind of brokenness. We were broken in our relationship with God. Then it messed up everything else in the garden. Everything else became divided. Relationships and humankind and, you know, 
humanity versus our, 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 our taking care of our world in all these different divisions. Christ came first to reconcile our souls with God. And uh, that's not it, gang. It doesn't stop there. Watch this. This is a little bit, a couple verses later in Ephesians 2. Watch. You know, the, the, the Jews and Gentiles were divided. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose, now listen, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Did you get it? <laughs> Jesus came to break down the walls of hostility and anger and hatred and division and polarization. Jesus came to make the two one. That is the gospel. That's not just a little afterthought. This is central to the gospel, gang. That's Christ's work on the cross, bringing, uh, 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 reconciling us to God and to one another. Now, what's our work? Ephesians 3, 10. I think this is powerful. His intent was that now, through whom? The church. Is the world to take the lead? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the mystery of the gospel. He talks about, in, in, in Ephesians 3, about the mystery of the gospel. Here's the mystery of the gospel. Through Christ, we have reconciliation with God and with one another, and the church is to be a visible display in the world of this oneness. That's what, that's what Paul is teaching in this very important theological piece. That the gospel is about uniting us to God and to one another. And the church is to be the visible manifestation of that. Now, sadly, less than 3% of American churches are multicultural. Because I think we're missing the heart of the gospel. Gang, if, if you wear a cross around your neck, if you look at a cross, do you know the purpose of this cross is that Jesus came to reconcile us to God and to one another. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came to reconcile us, those of us who are different, Republicans and Democrats, whites and blacks, and everyone in between, old and young, socioeconomically uh, rich and poor. He came to make us one. And we are to be the agents of that. Ephesians 2, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, teaches us very clearly that we are to be agents of reconciliation, ambassadors of Christ. What's an ambassador? A representative, somebody who represents. We, who do we represent in the world? Jesus. And the way we represent this is by lobbing bombs on those who disagree with us. We came to be ambassadors. How are we doing, church, individuals, as reconciling agents in the world that we live in today? Are we stuck in our tribes or are we blessing the world? Are we furthering the divide? Or are we bringing reconciliation? Let me give us four words as I close about uh, how we can grow as reconcilers in a polarized world. Four scriptural mandates and words of how we can grow as reconcilers. Moving from uh, ones who divide to ones who reconcile. Here they are, four words. A another way of saying this would be Four words from Scripture of how we can become more like Jesus. Okay? First word. Uh, by the way, we're not going to enjoy these. All right? Just so you know, these are going to be tough. Humility. Humility. Now, the Philippian church was divided in certain ways. And so the Apostle Paul speaks to them. 
And there was separation again. Read it with me, ready? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Time out. In another translation, it says, consider others more important than yourself. I like that a little bit better. Whoa. Not looking, together, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. He says, don't be myopic. It's not all about you. It's some about you, but it's also about your brother or sister who's different than you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And then he gives the very annoying example of Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be asked. And not only did he lay aside his preferences, his rights, he laid down his very life. He shed his blood to give us peace with God and with each other. Can we lay aside our agendas for just a second to maybe consider that I may not have it all right? What humility does is to say, you know what? I may not have it all all right here. I may have missed it in certain ways. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because we want to fight for our rights. We want to fight for our opinion. I'm right, they're wrong, and expletive. (laughs) Right? That's what we want to do. Dave did not swear in church today. All right. So, first thing is humility. Um, And I think... Uh, the most humble thing that we can say is, you know what, I might be able to learn from my brother or sister who's different than me and thinks differently than me. The second word that leads to this humility is to listen. Is to listen. Can I just say it straight? I've been kind of beating around the bush a lot today anyway. Uh, People and Christians are good at blurting out what we believe, and yelling at people who don't believe like we do. Uh, Ed Stetzer says it like this. We're often too quick to jump on social media to punish our keyboard with our anger and scream at a disagreeing person who might stand in our path. A hypothesis that I'm kind of wrestling with right now is I think the American evangelical church is mad at the world. Because we have this idea that we live in a Christian America. And how could, how, how could they possibly think like that? How could they possibly vote like that? How could they possibly act like that? How could they possibly behave like that? And I think the first thing we need to do is just, right now, just recognize that we do not live in a Christian nation. I mean, socially, ethically, morally, every way, we are just not a Christian nation. Maybe, maybe at some point we were, but that day is not now. And we have, to dis- we have to learn how to live in a world that is not primarily, you know, if we think that America is Christian, we may have to rediscover our definition of Christianity, of what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, so I, I think we have to learn how do we coexist in a world with many, many people who think and act and behave very differently than we do. Do you think we're going to win the day by our triumph? I'm right and you're an idiot. Is that going to work? So we need to listen. Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand, then be understood. What would happen if we changed our vitriol and our passion about being right instead to asking questions and to listen? You know, hey, I, I, I'm not understanding. Help me understand. You, you think differently than me. I, I might need to understand. See, we're so busy wanting to be right and wanting to prove our way that we don't often listen to our brother or sister who's different. What if we were to start with, hmm, help me understand. Now, this verse, might, you, this might be the most important word you hear today. Someone this is going to hit. And you may need to memorize this scripture. I'm memorizing it this week because I still don't have it down. All right? Read it. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Take note. 
Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, I'm not saying that injustice shouldn't make us angry at times. It shouldn't cause us to rile, but how we express that is important. Be slow, be quick to listen. And I wonder how many of us are quick to speak, quick to become angry, and slow to listen. Some of us might need to memorize that one. Humility, listening. Third one, love. The scriptures teach something in, infinitely more important than being right or furthering my tribe's position. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself and even to love your enemy. Now, uh, at, when Jesus said, you know, they asked him, Jesus, what's the most important thing? What did Jesus say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. He said those are the two most important things. And then they asked the question, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, the one that's exactly just like you. No? The one that's really nice and that you like a lot. That's your neighbor. Jesus gives them the example of the good Samaritan. And as soon as Jesus said good Samaritan, the Jews said, time out, that's an oxymoron. Don't you realize that that doesn't work, Jesus? There are no good Samaritans. They are our enemies. They are worthless. They're like those Democrats or Republicans or whatever side you land on. And Jesus says, no, that's your neighbor. The one that you don't agree with, that you don't like. Love your neighbor as yourself. The way that we become one is humility listening, and love. And here's the sad part. So often the church is not known today for its radical love. What is it often characterized? What do you hear in the media, in the world today? How is the church often characterized? What are words? Judgmental, hypocritical, what else? Intolerant, hate. Is that sad? Our number one command is to love. And we're known for its opposite. What if we lived, what if, what if in 10 years from now, our world would say, you know, I sure don't agree with those Christians, but man, they are so stinking loving and caring and kind that I gotta respect them. What would happen if that were the day that we were known by our love? In the final words, so we have, what do we got? We got humility. What else? Listen, love, and friendship. Friendship. I shared earlier that the things that polarizes us most in our culture are fear and isolation. And fear and isolation lead to misunderstanding, prejudice, hatred, and it becomes an us versus them, right? That's what happens in the lack of relationship. We don't understand someone, and so there, we, we, we have prejudice, we have hatred, we have misunderstanding, we have us versus them. But here's what relationship does. Relationship breaks down walls. When we get to know our brother or sister who's different than us, then we begin to understand. And when we begin to understand, then we begin to love and respect those that we may not totally agree with, but we understand them. And gang, the number one thing I know in my life, and I know many of yours, is that relationship breaks down walls. It's my friendship with Jamie Clay, who, is a now, who was a gangbanger and is now a teaching pastor at our Riverdale location. Being in re relationship with him, meeting with him over dozens of coffees, getting to know his story, that breaks down walls. It's getting to know my brother Jason. It's getting to know my, my sister Ann, Ann Bilbrew, who are pastors. It's getting to know Milton, and it's getting to know Glenn, and it's getting to know others that I know are, are my friends that breaks down walls. Now I understand better. 
not perfect. But it's friendship that breaks down walls and builds bridges. And I want to ask, when was the last time you had a conversation with somebody who differed radically from you? Politically? Theologically? Spiritually? Uh, ethnically? When was the last time you had someone from a different ethnicity with their feet under your table? Because see, what breaks down walls and builds bridges is humility and listening and loving and friendship. Amen? Let's stand and uh, let's pray together. We're going to take a moment to reflect. So maybe just close your eyes and open your spirit to the Heavenly Father. And I just want to ask, how are you doing really? How humble are you? Is it more important to be right? Or is it more important to love? Are you quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? And Spirit of God, would you show us what we need to hear today? What is that word for our lives and our hearts today? Jesus doesn't speak of tolerance. He speaks of love. Love those who are different. Love your enemies. And he speaks of friendship. Do I have friends that are different than me? Maybe we disagree. But do we have friends of different ethnicities? Do we have friends of different political stripe? I want to invite the uh, prayer ministers to come forward as well. And I just want to offer us a time together as a community of faith to do two things. One would be to confess. If there's ways in which we recognize that, you know what, I have been polarized because of my own ignorance or fear of my brother or sister. Or maybe I've been so influenced by social media or the news brand that I trust most that I have learned to hate. Maybe we recognize that we haven't been humble or maybe we haven't really been listeners or maybe we haven't really been loving. Maybe it would be just time in quiet just to ask for forgiveness because it starts with me and it starts with you. Reconciliation begins in my heart. Forgive us, King Jesus, where we've missed it. Lord God, forgive me for my pride, my arrogance, my self-centeredness, my self-righteousness, all those things that don't characterize the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of the evil one. Forgive us as a church, and I'm not just saying living springs, but as a church in America for not representing the king of kings for not representing Jesus well oftentimes. Forgive me, forgive us. And I don't want to move too quickly from that. If there's some business you need to do with God, I would invite you at the close of our time together just to come and to be ministered to, to, to maybe to kneel at the altar or to pray and ask for forgiveness. But maybe some of us are stinging from wounds that have happened to us where we have felt the sharp end of the spear from someone else's words. Maybe we have felt hated or misunderstood or judged. Maybe because we're old or maybe because we're young or maybe because we're a certain ethnicity or maybe... And maybe we're hurting. Lord Jesus, we know that you came, that you shed your blood on the cross so that we may be healed. So Spirit of God, would you heal those of us who have experienced the sting and the trauma of racism or sexism? Or age 
ageism, classism. So Lord, we pray that you would minister and speak peace to my brothers and sisters. And God, we're asking that you would help us to live out your plan to, to, to display the mystery of the cross of bringing reconciliation. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 If you need any prayer, the prayer ministers are here. We'd love to pray with you for whatever, whatever need you come. Uh, let me give us a blessing and we'll sing together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may the Lord use you as an agent of reconciliation in your home, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, in your schools, wherever you find yourself, that you might be an agent of reconciliation, of humility, listening ear, love, and friendship. Amen and amen.